Brothers and sisters, it is again an honor and privilege to be for me to bring to you God's message this morning from His Word. So the message for today comes from the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 to 22. And we began studying this passage last week in the morning and evening or in afternoon service. So this morning we continue appreciating this, this wonderful message of hope and regeneration packed in this portion of Paul's letter to the church of Ephesus. So then I'll ask you in the copy of, in the copy of, of God's Word, turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 2. And we'll read from verse 11 to verse 22, but for our message this, this morning we'll pick up from verse 17 to the end of the passage. So let us now hear what the Lord has to say to us. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 to 22. Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at, one, at, at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, who you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in the place of in place of the two so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross thereby killing the hostility and he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near for through him we both have access in one spirit to the faith, to the Father. Sorry. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Now from this text, brothers and sisters, that we are studying this morning, which is verse 17 to 22, we see Paul presenting to you a believer with four pieces of evidence of how Christ's preaching changed your background so that you can live for God. So we see four pieces of evidence of how Christ's preaching changed your background so that you can live for God. The first piece of, in, of evidence we note is in verse 18. Your background has, has, has changed in this manner. You now have access to God. You now have access to God. That's the first piece. And the second piece of evidence we see in verse 19b, and we note the evidence in that contrasting statement. You are now fellow citizens of God's people. You are now fellow citizens of God's people. The third piece of evidence is there in verse 19c. You are now a member of God's family. And lastly, we find our fourth piece of evidence in verse 22. You are now a temple being built for God. You are now a temple built for God. So, brothers and sisters, the, the true gospel of Jesus Christ is not only the message that saves lives, but it is the message that changes life or lives. This is how the, the writers of the New Testament, such as Paul, do present the, the gospel message to their audience and hearers, that it changes lives. 
And one author rightly remarks that the gospel changes everything. The gospel changes everything, and that's the primary message of the New Testament, says this author. Now, Paul, who is the writer of, uh, to the Ephesians, is one man who has first knowledge or first-hand knowledge of this truth or fact about the gospel. If you remember that this man is the man who proclaimed in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, that he is not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. This is the man who was radically changed by the power of this message. Paul was transformed from being a murderer to become a missionary. He was transformed from being a devout traditionalist to a faithful evangelist. The gospel changed Paul's mindset. It changed his goals. His identity changed. His purpose changed. His attitude and demeanor changed. He became a new person and listened to, listened to his brief personal testimony as how his life changed. And you can turn with me to Galatians chapter 1, verse 14 to 17. Just to hear from Paul's mouth how the gospel changed his life. Galatians 1, verse 14 to 17. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach, preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. So you see that, that go, uh, um, the, the gospel indeed changed Paul's life. This was the man who was known as Saul, and he became Paul. He became Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. That's his, that is the, the radical change we talk about. That's the moment of 180 degree turn for Paul that you hear when people get transformed by the gospel. Now in this letter to the Ephesians, we heard last Sunday that Paul in this portion of, of the letter from verse 11 to verse 12, he was giving the Ephesians, he was giving those saints reasons why they must remember their sinful past with, with the aim that they will appreciate their present position in Christ. Now, the present reality is that Christ has changed their lives. He has positively and positionally so changed their relationship and standing with God. Remember, previously, the Ephesians were lost in the world. They were without God. They were separated from Christ. They had no relationship with God. They were not seeking for God as we learned last week. But now, in Christ Jesus, as verse 13 starts, now in Christ Jesus, they have been brought closer to God. They now have a relationship with God. They now have a right standing with God. And this relationship and position with God, they have attained when they believed in Christ, when they believed the word of truth, the gospel of their salvation. And Paul notes that about them in chapter 1, verse 13. The saints have now faith in the Lord Jesus Christ by believing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we've seen in our text previously, previously that based on Christ's work on the cross, all you who believe, regardless of your ethnic background, are now reconciled to God. You are now reconciled also to your fellow human being. According to Paul, in, in Christ, this is possible because, because Christ has become our peace. In the context 
of the letter. Peace there refers to the, to the type of sacrifice Christ offered in himself on the cross. He was our peace offering, which was acceptable to God. Hence, his peace offering of himself reconciled both the Gentiles and the Jews. And then, that unity, while those two are united, which is unique, by the way, which is something new, then he reconciled this new creation to God. That's what we have seen before. So we come to verse 17, we see that this peace is very much the context, the content of the gospel message, which Christ preached to those who were far away, referring there to the Gentiles, and to those who were near, referring to the Jews. Now, although this, the message was proclaimed by Paul and others who were in his company to the Ephesians in particular, since Paul regarded himself as the representative, he regarded himself as an ambassador of Christ, he understood that Christ was speaking through him. Firstly, because the spirit of truth, the comforter was in him as Christ promised his followers in John 14, 15 to 18, that he will not leave them as orphans, but he will ask the Father and will send, the Father will send them another helper. That's how Paul understood that the gospel was being preached by Christ. And secondly, Christ was speaking through Paul because Christ is the author of this, of this message. He's the author of the system of religion which proclaimed salvation to both the Jew and the Gentile. If you remember from Acts chapter 2, this is the same message which was preached by Peter from the beginning on the day of Pentecost. And I'll ask you to again turn just quickly back to Acts chapter 2. Turn to chapter, uh, Acts chapter 2 and we'll, we'll, we'll read from verse 37 to verse 39. As we go back to that great sermon of Peter on that day of Pentecost, just to show you that this is the same message, same gospel that Paul took to the Ephesians. Verse 37, it says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Verse 38, and Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. So you see there that according to, to Peter, this good news this, this good tidings about Jesus Christ is the same for the Jews. And at, in, 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 um, on the day, it was the Jews who were gathered at Jerusalem coming to observe or celebrate this feast of Pentecost. And Peter says again that the same message is for the Gentiles. As he says there, those who are far off, those who are far away, that time would have been the Gentiles. The message is about Jesus Christ who died on the cross for the remission of our sins. And Peter says, if anyone repents of his sins, the sins that caused Jesus Christ to die on the cross, if anyone repents of that and accept that Jesus is both Lord and Christ, he or she will receive the forgiveness of sins, and will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the gospel message. That's the power of God unto salvation, which was preached by Peter, and later on preached by Paul to the Gentiles. This is the message that changes, that changes everything. 
as we outlined in our study of the text earlier. Paul wants to show his heras, his heras, sorry, his heras, heras and, and you today, brothers and sisters, the, this piece of evidence as to how this preaching of Christ, of the same message, changed your sinful background. And we move on to our first piece of evidence, which we saw in verse 18a, which says that now that your background has been, has been changed, you have access to God. You have access to God. Now, this is a wonderful truth to be reassured of. That now, now that you are in Christ, you have this, this privilege of having direct access to God. Now, remember this way, where, where people who, as we saw again, uh, looking back, they were godless at some point. They were hopeless. They were homeless. And were spiritually dead. And Paul earlier described the, their relationship to God and to, to, to God's people as, as strangers. He used that, that language, strangers, alienated, hostile. But now in Christ, they are able to approach God directly because this, this barrier of hostility has been removed through the death of Christ on the cross. The barrier of hostility, the wall of hostility has been removed. And please note, note Paul's use of that, that plural pronoun, we, to indicate that the privilege is enjoyed by both these ethnicities, which were once hostile to one another. So both Jews and Gentiles who believe in Christ have now the same privilege of accessing God. There is no special treatment, treatment or, or favoritism. If you are in Christ, you have the same right in front of God as your, 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 your next brother or sister. This is the result, brothers and sisters, of Christ's effort of uniting us from different cultures, from different ethnicities, to show that indeed in him there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female. For, for, for you are all one in Christ. For you are all one in Christ. And you see that in Galatians 3, verse 28. Now, these earthly, this earthly labels, these earthly criteria are irrelevant in Christ. The gospel makes, men all, makes all men equal before God both as sinners and subjects of redeeming grace. So in front of God, brothers and sisters, we are all this, the same. This, this national and, and social and sexual partition walls are now broken in Christ. We are all the same and, e and equal. And not to be missed in, in verse 18a is the ministry role of the Holy Spirit. We are aided by him to have this access to God, the Father. It is by his agency, it is by his operation that we have been united into one body. And we'll see this, the Holy Spirit again being mentioned in verse 22 later. So Paul credits the Holy Spirit for the, for the same role somewhere else as he writes to the, to the um, Corinthians. And he says, the following about the, the spirit. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. So the Holy Spirit, too, plays a crucial role in this work of reconciliation. He keeps us united. He's someone, uh, he's someone, <clears throat> sorry, lost my place now. So if, <clears throat> if someone has accepted Christ this morning, we, we all have one thing in common. If you sit at here and have accepted Christ, you have someone, someone in common. And this is this um, Holy Spirit. He is the Holy Spirit who indwells us. And he has indwelt you since the day of your redemption. 
there are significant truths to mention <coughs> about the Holy Spirit from this verse. Firstly, we see that, as I said, the Holy Spirit keeps God's people united. Secondly, he is the only spirit which brings us in fellowship with God. And thirdly, we see that he is the only spirit acceptable in front of God. Not any other spirits, any spirits that can be linked at the time to Greek mythology, not your ancestors' spirits, nothing but the Holy Spirit unites uh, or is acceptable in front of God. Now to conclude on this first piece of evidence of how Christ's preaching changed your background, we have seen that your relationship with God has drastically changed. You have moved from being far off from God in the past and to now having access to him through one spirit. And that takes us to the second piece of evidence to consider, which is that you are now a fellow citizen of God's people. You are now a fellow citizen of God's people. It's our second piece of evidence. That is the status you now receive as a Christian, a fellow citizen to, 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 to the kingdom of God. You too now have part in this, this covenant promise, which at one point was exclusive to the descendants of, of Abraham in the flesh. Again, Christ's death changed things. His message of salvation restored how things should operate in the economy of God. Citizenship into this commonwealth was never meant to be by physical birth, but it was meant to be by grace through faith. That was the only criteria as it was with um, the father of faith, Abraham himself. And Moses tells us in Genesis 15, 6, that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him righteousness. So Abraham was saved by grace through faith. So the same saving criteria would have been used by God to save those who descended from Abraham. The Lord God throughout history would have required the Israelites to believe in him for their salvation. Salvation was, was never based on works of the law. This is made, it's made much clearer by the New Testament writers, such as, such as Paul himself in Romans 3 verse 20, Romans 3 verse 28, and Galatians chapter 2 verse 16 and 21. So to attain the citizenship of the kingdom, it was through believing in God. As they, they would say in the Old Testament, it's calling on the, Lord, the Lord's name and he would be, uh, um, the one who calls out on the Lord's name would be delivered, as we see in Joel chapter 2, verse 32, which is the same passage Peter quoted when he preached that sermon on, the Pente on Pentecost. So those who would call on the name of the Lord, those who would put their faith on Yahweh, they would be saved. Now, as per Paul, when the Messiah came, he preached the same message of salvation to both the Gentiles and the Jews and to those who believed at Ephesus as a result of them accepting the message, they were conferred with the citizenship. They were given this status to be fellow citizens with the saints. This is the evidence which Paul is presenting to, to the Ephesians to show them that they are no longer strangers and aliens, but have been changed by the preaching of, of Christ. Their identity, as we saw with Paul, their identity, their attitude, their goals, their demeanor, everything has changed about them. This is to show that the gospel has indeed changed their lives. One more evidence in verse 19, which is similar to the previous one, is to show that, to show you that, brother and sister, that the gospel has not only made you fellow citizen with, with God's people, it has now made you member of God's family. You are now 
member of the household of God. You are now a member of God's family. And that's exactly Paul's message in verse 19c. If you look at the, the verse closer. Believers are members of God's family. This means that you've literally moved families. And this will, make, this will uh, uh, better make sense if it is explained in relation to verse 2 of chapter, of the same chapter. Friend, as, as an unbeliever, you would have been following the traditions and the, the systems of this world. You were influenced by the devil. We've seen that before. If you are influenced by the devil, then it means that you belong to him. You have control over your life. You were his, his subject. But when you received Christ's message, you were born again. It means that you moved families, as I said. You moved from the, the family you, you were initially born into as a baby with a sinful nature. You moved to your new adopted family, which is the, the family of God. If you have gone through the, the membership classes here at FSBC, you know what I'm, what I'm talking about. Because lesson one of our membership lessons explains this concept of two families in the world in details. And it gives you more uh, or many other scripture references just to, to explain to you how it works. So maybe take a look at the lesson again this afternoon just to remind yourself of this type of change which took place since you became a believer in Christ. Now, if you come back to our text, we see Paul in subsequent verses describing this household or this family of God. Now Paul uses a series of building metaphors to describe God's family, which is the church. In verse 28, he says that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Now, it's easy to see that here that the people who occupied these offices did the, the initial work which contributed to the setup of this family, which is the church, as I said. The, the apostles, 12 apostles and Paul, and most possibly the, the New Testament prophets. As we see in, in, in Acts 11.27, we had Agabus, who is called a prophet, and other, others who are not listed. So those would be the two groups, apostles and prophets. Um, and I say the New Testament prophet because later on Paul is going to say that those would be the same prophets which the, the mystery of the church was revealed to in chapter 3, verse 5. So the same sets of offices, apostles, and prophets, the mystery of the church was revealed to them. So this would have been um, contemporary or uh, uh, prophets who were in the New Testament. So these offices were, were the first leaders tasked to preach and to teach the gospel and establish the church. The Lord used their teachings and, and doctrines to start this process of building the church after the Lord ascended back to, to heaven. Through them, the Lord laid the foundation for the church to, to rise up, to be built up. All their works, as I said, are recorded for us in the books of, in the book of, of Acts. And you can go through the book at your own time just to see this, this wonderful work they had done to, to set up the, the foundation, which tells you that we should not have anyone today referring to himself as, as an apostle. Because the apostles have, have laid the foundation and the Lord is building onto them. But to show that Christ was working through them, Paul compares the Lord with, with a cornerstone in this building structure. According to commentators, the, the cornerstone is the most essential stone on the foundation. This represents that Christ is the chief among the stones to be, to be used for this building. In size and in, in influence, 
is, he's the largest. He's the biggest. You can say he is the strongest. Everything else in this household hangs or is, 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 is built on him. He holds the structure together. That's the next uh, um, metaphor or metaphorical comparison of his role in the church. Now, as the one with this most essential function or role, everything in the church comes together in Christ. It is done for Christ. It is done with Christ. It is done through Christ. Basically, we can do nothing successful in church if it's not for Christ's glory. Remember, he is the one who is building his church, as he tells us in Matthew 8, 16, verse 18. So no enemy, no enemy of his can thwart, can thwart this, this work. This work in the church is like, I see it as, as a moving train. If you attempt to stop it, you will be crushed. If you attempt to stop it, you will be crushed. Now Christ will eventually achieve his goal of building a holy temple, which is a body of believers who love Christ and I devoted to him and to his purpose. Anything unclean, anything impure will be removed from this temple because this should be a holy temple. And that's, that's part, of, part of building up. When you're building, you're removing stones that are, are not usable, you throw them away, and you only use those who were meant for this building project. And let me remind you again, friends, that if you have accepted, accepted Christ's message of salvation, you are part of this body. You are part of this building, a living building. And lastly, the last piece of evidence we see there is that you are now a temple built for God. It's almost similar to the, the previous one. This would have uh, um, most probably been intriguing to, to the Ephesians who were listening to, to Paul because they themselves come from the background of idol worship. Before they were saved, they worshipped in temples dedicated to, to gods made with hands. They carried along idols, small shrines, but now they, they are informed that they themselves are the temple of the true God. And this, this Jesus, whom they cannot see, is busy building them up into a temple in which this invisible God who created the, the heavens and the earth resides in them as he, dwells, as he dwells in them by the Spirit. Hence I say this would have been intriguing to them because they, they come from things they could, they could hold, things they could touch, tangible things. Now Paul speaks to them about these this things that are happening to them by, by Christ, them being built up into this, this, this invisible, invisible temple, this invisible body of believers. Now here again, as I said earlier, we see the ministry of the Spirit in, in our lives, the life of the church. He's the one who God builds us through. He is God's agent in this building work. The Spirit is alive in us believers. He's the one who teaches us in all things. He's the one who, who brings to our remembrance the Word of God, just as he did with the apostles. And as we conclude, I trust that this, this piece of evidence Paul presented to you this morning would inspire you to live for God in this body of believers. They will inspire you to appreciate that 
the, the, the gospel indeed changes lives. Then I'll urge you to, to check your life. If indeed your life has been changed by the gospel. Does this message resonate with you? Do you see these changes in your life? Do you appreciate that you do now have direct access to God? You are no longer a stranger to Him. You're part of His family. You're part of this beautiful temple, holy temple that's been built up. Please check if indeed you have been changed. It might be that you've not had the, the preaching of Christ before. You have not accepted his message of salvation. Now, if that's the case, please do not leave here today without, without talking further about this matter, without speaking to, to either myself or anybody here, any member here, for us to try and help you, to try and help you to see and understand Christ's preaching. Because Christ is still preaching today. He preaches through this, through this book. He preaches through us as we continue to, to give this message, this message which, which is power unto salvation to those who are not, who are not yet being brought closer to God, who are still far from him. Let me pray for us. Oh dear Lord, we, we once again we just thank you for we thank you for your gospel, oh Lord. We thank you for for the benefit the gospel has brought in our lives. We thank you for the proof, for the evidence we see in our lives, in our in our brothers and sisters' lives, to be able to say that yes. They have changed. They, they have been moved from this family of the evil one into our family. They, they talk and, and, and think and act like those who belong to us, those who belong to you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for continuing to preach this message. You continue to, re to remind us about where we come from. Oh Lord, help us not to, not, not to forget, not to be like the world that forgets about the history and goes and makes the same mistake again and again and again. As we've seen even last week with systems of this world which are evil and have always been evil throughout the ages systems of this world that has discriminated against the weak, against those who are poor, against the minorities. We see those mistakes being repeated, oh Lord. Help us not to forget where we come from, where you've saved us from, so that, oh Lord, we can appreciate that we need to save you. We need to save you in this church. If we, if you cause us to, to live here, O oh Lord, and place us somewhere else, we should be continuing to save you there. Because, O oh Lord, we belong to you. We are influenced by you. You are in control in our lives if we are truly saved. Thank you again for this message. We ask you that, Lord, you be with us as we go our separate way. In your name we pray. Amen.